Hello everyone and welcome back to the Manic Manor podcast. This is Mitchie. And for today's episode, we are going to go into a case that happened 26, actually almost 27 years ago in Itaewon, South Korea. Now, Itaewon has been largely famous for things such as the K-drama Itaewon class, uh, most recently, devastatingly, what happened Halloween a few years back now. But Itaewon has been known as a popular foreign destination in South Korea, and with that, there came a lot of negative stigma as well, and this was no different in the year 1997. The popularity grew even more, as I said, with foreigners that would come over in the 90s, thanks to like the Korean wave and shows such as Itaewon Class. But you've heard from the dark side of Seoul that Itaewon has a very, very dark side. Jap- uh, Japanese occupation saw a lot of horrible things that would happen in the past, such as assaults that happened to nuns that were in temples that were nearby. And now the area, as it progressed, became known more for nightlife and tourist destinations, as well as storing a U.S. Army base that was nearby the town. And because of the U.S. Army base, there was a lot of foreign population. And a lot of the people that lived in the area had a negative view of these people that were there because they thought foreigners could possibly, you know, portray to the downfall of the area. And the case that we're going to talk about today did not help with the negative reputation that ET1 had. And it went unresolved for the longest time until just recently in upcoming years that the case, you know, was solved and closed. So this case centers around a young man named Cho Jung Pil. He was born in 1974. At the time, he was 22 years old and attending Hongik University of Engineering. His older sister was interviewed and spoke barely highly of her brother like She would say he was a precious talent, and he had a bright future that was ahead of him when his life was taken away so tragically. He lived his life like any hardworking and diligent Korean university student would, especially at that time. He studied hard, worked to get good grades, and tried to make somewhat of a social life for himself. At the time, he had a girlfriend who he would spend just about any free time that he could with. And when he wasn't doing that, he was working part-time to help his family through tough times because his family had been in poverty and he wanted to help them. This brings us to the night of April 3rd, 1997, around 10 p.m. Joe was out with his girlfriend having a date when they decided that they were going to stop by a Burger King that was in Itaewon. She had been ordering food for them while he had excused himself to use the restroom because they had been out drinking a couple of beers after studying or something along those lines. The area was a very popular spot, especially for nightclubbing, drinking, and on the bil- well, in the building that the Burger King was, towards the fourth floor, there was a nightclub. So people would go clubbing and drinking on the fourth floor, come down a few floors to the Burger King to get them a snack when they were hungry. So Joe's girlfriend, she was ordering food or some drinks or something for them and was waiting for quite a while for him to return because he had only excused himself to the restroom so it shouldn't have taken that long. When he didn't come out, she started to get a little worried so she went to go check on him. When she went to the restroom, it was mentioned that She saw a man leave in the bathroom who looked very suspicious with wide bulging eyes. So she goes into the bathroom to find out where Joe is. When she comes into the bathroom, it is an absolute horror scene. She finds Joe bleeding out in the bathroom. So of course, paramedics, first responders, they're called to this Burger King to get his body and try to take him to the hospital to help him. And as he's on the way to the hospital, he would sadly pass away during transport. He would be pronounced dead. When they did an autopsy, it revealed that Joe had suffered nine fatal stab wounds, 
to both the neck and chest area, resulting in a massive loss of blood. And so, they started an investigation. None of it made sense. Joe was known to be a very kind, very gentle person, especially to his friends, family, and his girlfriend. He had no known enemies and no reason to be the target of anything. So as they were doing the investigation, the scene, as I mentioned before, it was a horror show and an absolute bloodbath. Floor, wall, everything that you could possibly imagine was covered in blood. And part of the autopsy had shown that when he was being stabbed, his artery had been stabbed as well, which caused a lot of the blood to spray out, and that's what caused, you know, the splash on the wall. So the authorities were trying to find a suspect, and it was like looking for a needle in a haystack, because they had really no clues to go off of. This seemed like an attack completely unprovoked. It would be a miracle and would take one to locate anybody who could provide a lead or something just to figure out what had happened to this young man. But they would get a break. They received an anonymous call coming in regarding a potential suspect. This caller named an 18-year-old by the name of Arthur Patterson. Arthur had lived in Korea but was born in California. He had an American father and a South Korean mother, and at the time his father was a soldier stationed at the U.S. Army base in Korea. Now a little background into Patterson showed that he had had some trouble in the past following him, especially in his adolescence. He had a list of arrests in the States and claimed ties to gangs and had supposedly served time in jail back in the United States before his family moved to Korea. He was also known from other family members to be a very disrespectful person and difficult to raise and control. So with this potential lead in fact, they took him into questioning by Army investigators given that there were ties that he had to the U.S. Army base. And because of this, a group known as CID took over. Initially, it was said that he tried to avoid being found, which seemed very suspicious to them, but they were able to catch him and bring him in for questioning. Initially, Patterson denied any kind of involvement in the case, but soon his story would alter and he would say that he actually was in the area at the time of the stabbing. Now, his story was that he was out with friends partying and drinking. The club that they were on, as I said, was on the fourth floor of the building that the same Burger King was in. So they would go down after partying to grab food and eat. Now, he mentioned a friend specifically by the name of Edward Lee. Lee was also Korean-American and had spent some time in the States and was just recently over in Korea. Now, Eddie's family didn't have any kind of struggle whatsoever, and they seemed to come from a better-off background than what Patterson came from. So it's unknown how the friendship between these two started, but they were hanging out that night. Now, Patterson goes on to say, while eating, the story went that Patterson took out a knife that he had in his pocket, and he had always carried this with him, and he was using it to cut his burger and show it off. The story broke off into two separate parts. So since Edward Lee was mentioned, he also would be brought in for questioning. So it was a story of Patterson versus Lee. And it should also be mentioned that Edward, unlike Patterson, was actually willing to talk to the police. He surrendered and was interviewed just four days after the incident where police had to go find Patterson. Now, going on, continuing with Patterson's version, it was that Edward asked if he had murdered anybody with this knife before taking the knife from Patterson and pocketing it. He then went on to tell Patterson that he would show him something cool and to follow him. So they both ended up going into the bathroom, and this would be the same bathroom where Cho Jung Pil was. Patterson said he recalled seeing a Korean guy, and things happened so quickly he couldn't really comprehend it. It happened within the span of like maybe 10 seconds. From here, he implements Edward Lee as being the person to stab Cho Jung Pil multiple times. 
Now, when the authorities were interviewing Edward, the story differs at what happened in the bathroom. His story, of course, is the same as Patterson, that they had the knife out, um, they were just talking, chit-chatting, Patterson cut his burger, but then he said it was Patterson to be the one that said, I'll show you something cool, follow me. Edward said he went because he had to wash his hands anyway, he had stuff on them. So as he was in the bathroom washing his hands, he looked up in the mirror and from the reflection of the mirror saw Patterson stabbing a man who would be Cho Jung Pil. He claimed Patterson took the knife back before they even went into the bathroom and that he never had this knife in his pocket so he knew nothing about that. So it was word against word. With two stories that were implementing one another, they had to interview potential witnesses. They corroborated Eddie asking Patterson if he had stabbed a person. However, that's the only thing that any witness could agree on. Nobody else that saw that could agree on who said to follow who. And really, the only witnesses that they actually had were the friends of Lee and Patterson. Now, as the friends were being interviewed, the only other thing they said was that Edward Lee had ran out of the bathroom and came back to the table, and of course they see all the blood on his shirt, kind of spray-painted looking, and they asked him, you know, what the fuck happened in there? And they said that he looked kind of manic and was like, we stabbed someone. Patterson said he did it for fun. Now, another statement was made that Patterson never came back to the table and instead he would end up going up to the club bathroom on the fourth floor to wash off. From there, after he washed off, he exchanged some clothes with another friend that was still in the club and this friend said he appeared to be in a panic. After that, it was speculated that Patterson went to an army base and would actually end up burning the clothes he initially was wearing and tossed his knife into a sewer. Now, after all of this investigation, speculation fell that Patterson was the potential murderer. And so the CID drafted up a report, and because they were in Korea, they turned this finding over to the Korean police so that it could be properly prosecuted. Now, there's one thing that we have learned about Korean authority, especially in days that were before, you know, the mid-2000s. It's that they had a lot of negative stigma, and they received a fuck ton of backlash. And that backlash was usually due to lazy searching, lazy work, or any kind of blatant missing of anything. And this case was definitely no exception. Now, despite the Korean police literally being given an investigation on a silver platter. They looked at it and was like, yeah, fuck this. We're not going to use these findings. They just straight up ignored it and decided that they were going to look through their own lenses to figure out what had happened. Now, by this time, all of the scene had just been cleaned up course it's a Burger King they want to stay in business it's a corporation they're not gonna leave a bathroom caked in blood for any in any kind of investigation so since they didn't have the initial scene police begin to interview Edward and Patterson again Edward in his second interview now said that he couldn't remember anything that happened because he was so traumatized that he blocked it all out they went and decided that they were going to interview Patterson now. His second interview saw him changing the story where he was at the scene of the crime and was very exact to the very pinpoint on how the crime happened and was even willing to reenact it to the Korean police. And he said during this, something that he didn't say in the initial interviews, that the victim fell on him and that's why he had blood all over him. And for some reason, the Korean authorities seemed to believe Patterson, and their reasoning was that he remembered so much detail, therefore he was more credible than what Edward was. They also would say that killers will tend to block out things that happen, which 
has been proven now to not necessarily be true, but in 97, that's the reasoning they were going with. The authorities looked at the autopsy and was stating things like the angle of the stab wounds had a factor as the perpetrator had to be taller than the victim. And the thing about Edward Lee and Arthur Peterson was that Lee was taller than both Cho Chung Pil and Arthur Peterson. Arthur, or Patterson, excuse me, Arthur was a lot smaller. He was probably around 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, whereas Edward was closer to the 6 foot range as well as Cho Jung Pil. One more thing that the Korean authorities did was a lie detector test. Even though lie detector tests are not admissible in court, they looked at this and saw that Edward had failed and Patterson passed. And the question was simply, did you kill the victim? And like I said, there's a lot of issues with lie detectors, but authorities thought that it could be a point that it was a clear evidence of guilt at the time. But still, even with all of this, the authorities just completely trashed what the CID did and decided that they were going to charge Edward Lee instead of Arthur Patterson with the murder and... Patterson simply got a possession of having a weapon because they were able to recover the knife and verify that it was Patterson's. Now, through all of this, all the court hearings and proceedings and such, the court would sentence Edward to 20 years in prison for the murder. Patterson was found guilty of having the weapon and would receive, or receive a sentence of one year and six months. Now, Edward's family kept appealing this decision. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court in South Korea to overrule the decision. And by September of 98, Edward was acquitted due to lack of substantial evidence to convict him. And like I said, this case began with the murder of Cho Jung Pil in April of 97. So here we are just a bit over a year later in 98. And They've acquitted the only person that they've convicted. So they really tried to close and shut this really damn fast. But with an acquittal, they're back to square one. So now the Korean authorities are trying to find Patterson. Only to find out that Patterson had fled South Korea back to the U.S. a month prior of Eddie Lee's release. Now, normally, when you have criminal proceedings, you'll get a travel ban on your name to where you can't flee the country like what Patterson did. However, the prosecutors in this case failed to renew that ban over the span of like a couple of days up to a week. So before that ban was renewed, Patterson took that time and fled the country. So, Cho Jung Pil's family is now left heartbroken. They have no answers on what happened to their son. The only person that they thought was the killer is now proven innocent. He's been acquitted and he cannot be tried for it again. His mother and father swore that they would find who killed their son. And his father said that even if he passed, he wanted to be able to tell Cho Jung Pil when he met him again that they had caught his killer. And that is fucking heartbreaking, especially knowing the shit that this family had to suffer at the hands of just pure and complete incompetence. Now, Cho's family did everything that they could in their power to keep the case alive to seek justice for their son. They would write letters, they would do public speeches, and begged the authorities for help and all of this just seemed to fall on deaf ears. And that would fall completely unheard from the span of 1998 until around 2009. 2009 is when the movie came out about the murder. And it was pretty much just a cinematic retelling of what authorities had done on what people had believed had happened. And when this movie was released, it caused the popularity of this case to come back. And the public was so outraged, nationally and possibly even 
you know, globally. I don't know exactly how well the movie did overseas, but I know in South Korea, people were outraged at what had happened because, spoiler alert, not so spoiler alert, this movie is from 2009. People have had time to watch it if they want to. But the ending of the story was that they had no killer. So in December of 2009, right before the new year, a request would be made to extradite Patterson. Now, we also saw the infamous TV show Kokoshiya Goshipta cover the case to try to track down Patterson, and for some reason, the producers and the people on this show were able to get an interview with Patterson, who was almost 30 years old at this time, whereas the Korean police and authorities had let him slip through their fingers. And Patterson still maintained his innocence in this interview, talking about how he had a life he was trying to move on, which is really fucking ironic considering that this poor innocent victim did not get to. And it would take years of processing before they were actually able to extradite Patterson to South Korea in September of 2015. So, once he was extradited back over, the new investigation was underway, completed, and they started to look at blood analysis and all that. I mean, technology has come very far between 1997 and 2015. You're looking at like 18, 19 years difference. They recreated the scene in the bathroom because that Burger King where the crime had happened closed down because of negative connotation with this murder. They also examined stories from witnesses and how the blood would splatter from the attack, from the interviews that happened between Lee and Patterson. And they had found that Patterson's story couldn't possibly true because he couldn't have been standing where he had claimed to be standing from the photos that they had taken with the blood splatter back then. They also found that the killer would have had to be the person who was most covered in blood. Now, remember earlier I mentioned that Edward, when he fled the bathroom, he had what looked like a smear of spray paint on him compared to Patterson, according to eyewitnesses. Patterson, according to the one friend, had been covered in blood and Edward Lee was spray painted and this is something that led to Patterson burning his clothes from what the investigation found out. So from 2015, we're now in 2017. A verdict would come down on Patterson of guilty for the murder of Cho Chung Pil and all these years, all this time they spent finding him, fighting to get him, he was given a sentence of only 20 years behind bars. Now, he would have gotten a life sentence, but the laws in Korea are different, and the court looked at him being 18 or 17 or 16 Korean age at the time, so that technically would have made him a minor, and only gave him 20 years as opposed to a life sentence. Now, when the new prosecution was interviewed and how they believed Edward's influence on the case was, the prosecution stated that they believed he definitely had to have a part in the crime as a person to, at the very least, order out this crime. But Patterson was the one to actually commit it. But because he was acquitted, he could not be tried for the same crime again. So he essentially got off scot-free minus maybe a little bit of time that he had to serve behind bars. But now there is officially someone behind the bars for the murder of Cho Jung Pil in Itaewon in the spring of 1997. Even though the family finally had caught a killer, it did little to joy the family who lost a beautiful son to such callous behavior. And that will do it for today's episode. So I thank you guys for listening in. If you have any other information that you would like to include, please feel free to let me know. You can reach out at manicmanorpodcast at gmail.com. You can also comment on Facebook and Instagram at Manic Manor Podcast. We also have a Patreon if you feel inclined to support. That is patreon.com slash manicmanor. 
So I thank you guys for listening to this episode. And until the next episode, I hope you all have a wonderful day, a fantastic new year, and you stay safe. Bye-bye.